All right, is everybody ready? The Electoral College is an archaic and undemocratic method of electing a president that was established during a period of time when the voting population was largely uneducated and lacked access to information about the candidates. Therefore, Boston College stands resolved that the United States Electoral College should be abolished. The Electoral College should be abolished for three reasons. First, the Electoral College violates the principle of one person, one vote. Equality in voting is a core principle of all democracies. Robert Dahl, a leading democratic theorist at Yale University, argues that in a democracy, quote, every member must have an equal and effective opportunity to vote, and all votes must be counted as equal. The Electoral College makes a mockery of this principle. On five occasions in American history, in 1824, 1876, 1888, 2000, and most recently 2016, the candidate winning the most popular votes lost the election. Under the Electoral College, the allocation of electoral votes also violates political equality. Due to the senatorial bonus, which grants each state two electoral votes regardless of their population, small states gain greater representation than big states. For instance, each Wyoming elector represents 194,717 voters, whereas each California elector represents 705,454 voters. The disparity in voting power disadvantages minority populations because many of these communities reside in uh, underrepresented states, such as California, Texas, New York, and Florida. According to an analysis by the Urban Institute, Hispanics are nearly 10% less represented in the Electoral College than white people, and Asians are about 7% less represented. Faithless electors is yet another way the Electoral College undermines the will of the voters. A faithless elector is someone who goes rogue and does not vote for the candidate they had pledged to vote for. In the 2016 election, there were a record seven faithless electors, two pledged to Trump and five pledged to Clinton voted for other candidates. According to political scientist George Edwards, it is conceivable that in a close election, a faithless elector could snatch the presidency away from a candidate. A second harm to the Electoral College is that it suppresses voting in the United States. The reason is obvious. The Electoral College incentivizes winning battleground states and not winning the popular vote. Scott Lehigh, a Boston Globe columnist, observes the Electoral College reduces quote, a national election to a game of swing state hopscotch, in which the candidates focus on 10 or 12 competitive states while ignoring large swaths of the country. To illustrate this point, consider these statistics about the 2016 campaign. Between July 19th and November 7th, Clinton and Trump spent 57% of their campaign stops in just four states, Florida, North Carolina, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. And during the entire election, uh, in non-swing states, both candidates spent only 1% of their campaign funding and made only 5% of their campaign appearances. When voters in reliably red and reliably blue states are ignored, ignored by the campaigns, this discourages voting. Statistics from the 2016 election bear this out. For example, in the safe Republican states of Tennessee, Texas, and West Virginia, voter turnout was less than 53%. In the reliably safe Democratic state of Hawaii, voter turnout was a dismal 43%. And the problem of low voter turnout has persisted over several decades in U.S. presidential elections, being stuck in a range of 50 to 60 percent. This is awful compared to other countries. A 2016 Pew Research study based on voting data for high-income developed countries found the United States ranked a miserable 31st out of 55 countries. A third harm to the Electoral College is the possibility of a contingent election. According to the Twelfth Amendment, if there is a tie or no candidate receives a majority of the electoral votes, the House is required to elect the president by having each state delegation cast one vote. Although there has not been a contingent election since 1824, there is a high probability that it could happen again. According to political science professor George Edwards, the U.S. came close to having a deadlock in the Electoral College in seven elections, where a shift of a few votes in one or a few states would have meant no candidate received a majority of the electoral votes. A contingency election for choosing the president is a dreadful idea. It is anti-democratic to have the legislature pick the president instead of the people. The process disenfranchises voters of the District of Columbia who, ra who lack representation in the House and Senate. The method of voting is inequitable. The California House, House delegation with 53 representatives receives the same vote as the North Dakota House delegation with only one representative. There's the possibility of electing a president and a vice president from different parties because the Senate votes for the vice president. Can you imagine President Trump working with a vice president, Tim Kaine? And most troubling is the potential for unsavory deal making. This happened in 1824 when the House elected John Quincy Adams over Andrew Jackson. The perception that Adams had engaged in side deals to win over votes damaged his credibility and governing authority. 
The only solution which alleviates all of these harms is to replace the Electoral College with a direct popular vote for president. Jack Rakov, Stanford political science professor, argues uh, the only mode, only this mode of election fully conforms to the principle of one person, one vote, where everyone's vote is counted the same, regardless of where they voted. A national direct election would re-energize voting across the United States. Stephen Hill, a senior fellow with the New America Foundation, believes direct election will produce voter turnout surges across the country, as voters currently residing in one-party states would have an incentive to vote. Finally, direct election is the only way to eliminate the possibility of faithless electors going rogue or having a disastrous contingency election by the House. For the above reasons, we urge you to stand with Boston College and affirm the resolution that the Electoral College should be uh, destroyed. Uh, I stand ready for cross-examination. Does a direct popular vote make elections more competitive? What do you mean by that? Like, would a direct popular vote make elections between like one can candidate A and candidate B? Would it make it more like competitive between the two? Would it make the elections closer? Would it make them more competitive rather than like being a landslide victory? Uh, How do you define more competitive? I don't know what that means. Both candidates are going to try to be president, so uh, it'll be competitive either way. Cool. So on your argument about like contingent election, uh, a contingent election is about saying how like the tiebreaker is like bad in the status quo. Mm -hmm. This hasn't like this hasn't been a real problem since 1824. Why is it a reason to reject the electoral college now? Because it's a ticking time bomb. It hasn't happened since 1824, but political science evidence we read indicates that in seven elections in American history, a small swing in votes one direction or another could have led to it. And if we have this uh, okay. provision so in the Constitution, it's bad for democracy. Make an argument about faithless electors. Mm -hmm. And you said that there were seven faithless electors last year. Mm -hmm. Does it matter if there are faithless electors if they don't actually change the outcome of the election? Again, it hasn't happened yet, but the provision exists, which would also be so, uh, bad for our democratic system. So it's okay to base banning or ab abolishing the Electoral College on a system of what ifs? That's not the only reason we ban it. Faithless electors is just one of the problems we find with the Electoral College. So what does the world of the affirmative look like? The world of the affirmative looks like a direct popular election for president where every American uh, gets to cast an sure, equal vote regardless like? of where they live. It means what? you go to the polls and vote for president and we tally up the totals and that so person why, with the most votes becomes so president. So why wouldn't candidates just focus a more majority of their time in like urban areas where population density is highest? So uh, because there are, there are, they are going to go wherever the votes are around the country. So they're going to go where the votes are? So where yes. population density is highest? Well, right now, so they, right, hold on. right now they disproportionately focus on 10 to 12 swing states. Under a popular vote plan... They would focus on 10 to 12 big cities? No. Is that they're go, no, they're going to go to cities around the country. It, they'll focus on cities is largely so inevitable. Would there's on, only, so there's, why wouldn't they just try to win like the biggest cities, like Houston, Los Angeles, New York, Miami? Why, it's not why because they because, because those are different places. Like, Candidates already focus on large cities as well. We're okay. trying to reallocate it such that the so, 10 to 12 states which are typically focused on become less of a focus and there's more of a national okay. presence with the so electorate. So you argue that yes. like a reason to reject the Electoral College is that it violates the one person, one vote. Is the United States a direct democracy or a republic? Uh, I see where you're going with this. It is technically a constitutional republic, but we use a form of direct democracy to elect mayors, congressmen, senators, sure, we why think should governors. Be used for the federal government? Uh, because we already do for Congress and But the why Senate. should it be used for the president specifically? Because the president should have popular legitimacy, which should come from the people. Okay, so... You argue that it violates political equality, like the, the Electoral College and the status quo. How? Because it doesn't give people an equal voice. For example, How? like we said, so a Wyoming elector um, represents considerably fewer voters than a California elector, which means your vote in Wyoming has a lot more power than someone's vote in California. You're not equal. Okay, that makes sense. Um, going back to this... Like, I guess going back to the suppressing voting argument, mm -hmm. how many voters actually haven't gone out like to vote? Like, what's the decrease in voter turnout that's actually occurred because of the Electoral College? Well, we can, we've can we shown you that compared to other uh, industrialized, developed countries, our voter turnout is lower sure. as a result. Well, turnout last year? What does that mean? What percentage of the American people voted? Like, how many people went out to vote? I don't know what the number is. I think that it was like, I don't know the exact number either. I just know that it was okay. a lot so, more than historic. I don't know how productive this discussion is. Well, further, in our first contention, we read evidence specific to why uh, Asian Americans and Hispanics are disenfranchised beca uh, because of the representation as through the Electoral College, which how? means how? Yeah. Because they live in states that are technically underrepresented by the Electoral College. So it suppresses their give vote. urban centers more power would, solving, would solve that? It would reduce underrepresentation of certain minority communities. By giving urban yes. centers more power. That's not what we're That's advocating. That's not what we're advocating.
Is everyone ready? Yep. Riley and I negate resolved. The United States should abolish the Electoral College. We observe, abolish as, de as defined by Merriam-Webster is to formally put an end to, and for this reason, the affirmative needs to defend the full elimination of the Electoral College and not reform. We will offer three of our own arguments and then go on to our opponent's case. The first is reforming the winner-take-all Electoral College to become a district system. Matthew Cooper of Newsweek corroborates that removing the winner-take-all system of the Electoral College and replacing it with a system that apportions electors by congressional districts will require candidates to woo more of the country in order to win the race. This removes the winner-take-all system and creates a proportional system where depending on how many people vote a certain party, that is how many electors will be allocated to that candidate. Fritz Weller from the New York Times further argues that swing states would not exist and there would be less political partisanship as candidates need to spend more time in districts rather than just large cities to win over votes. In fact, George Chung from the Stanford Social Innovation Review finds that shifting out of a winner-take-all system could increase voter turnout by 9 to 12 percent. The second argument we will make is implementing compulsory voting and making Election Day a national holiday. Chris Weller of Business Insider explains that in the status quo, voter turnout in the U.S. is only at about 50 to 60 percent of the voting age population, with the result being a class bias that favors the voices of older age voting Americans over the voices of economic and racial mi minorities, as well as young Americans. Compulsory voting is the solution. Anthony Fowler of Harvard University found that Australia's turnout rate was like that of a lot of advanced democracies before it switched in 1924, at which point the law encouraged working class people, many of whom were otherwise disengaged from the political process, to learn about politics out of necessity. Now Australia has turnout rates upwards of 95%. Not only does compulsory voting increase turnout, it also creates a more representative politics. Fowler furthers that when Australia implemented compulsory voter laws, more progressive policies that aligned with the poor and working class were passed, creating a more representative system. Moreover, William Galston in the New York Times explains three benefits of compulsory voting. One, it would reinforce and strengthen citizenship. Two, it would strengthen our democracy by leveling disparities among citizens based on education, income, and other factors. And three, it would diminish political polarization. Galston sees campaigns appealing to more moderate swing voters who preferred compromise to confrontation and civil discourse to scorched earth rhetoric. He sees the House and Senate doing serious legislative work and congressional leaders returning power to the committees where members relearn the art of compromise cross party lines. Along with compulsory voting, the United States should make Election Day a national holiday. John Conyers in the New York Times explains that this is important because making Election Day a national holiday will allow people who can't vote due to their inability to leave work to be able to practice their civic duty to vote. This argument serves to prove that the Electoral College is not a reason for the low turnout, meaning that their basis that we need to abolish the Electoral College because turnout is low is logically inconsistent. Our third argument is that the removal of the Electoral College will lead to backlash. This is through the perception of the public. The public has vo voiced its opinion for wanting change to the Electoral College, yet William Kimberling from the Federal Election Commission argues that there is not a reliable enough system for a direct popular vote to be implemented. For this reason, Ryan Beckwith from Time argues that under a replacement system, the public would have been promised a solution when in reality it was underdeveloped, causing further political frustration. Gary Gregg of Politico concludes that those who are currently underrepresented right now would be even more underrepresented due to the sheer incompetence of a replacement in the status quo, which would only lead to more distrust in government. The overall impact is reducing voter turnout. Maya Satala from the University of Turku writes that voters who do not have trust in their government vote 15% less than those who do. The world of the negative is preferable to the world of the affirmative because uh, you get all of the ass benefits without the harms associated with the abolishment of the Electoral College. With that, let's move on to the affirmative case where I'll respond to some arguments. First, let's talk about this argument, this general argument that they make that the Electoral College promotes voter apathy. A couple of responses. First, our case solves. We literally tell you the fact that if we just were to simply reform the Electoral College from away from a winner-take-all system, voter turnout would actually increase and we would be able to reduce the distrust in government that people currently feel, thus decreasing voter apathy. Also, I want to make a quick note that they talk about faithless electors, they talk about all of these different harms of the current system, all of which can be fixed by reforming the system. They give you no reason independently as why we should abolish the entire Electoral College just for a few faults of the system. Every system is going to have its faults, but the Electoral College is going to be a better system than what my opponents are proposing. Secondly, it's non-unique. Too many There are too many alternative causes to turn out, and you as a judge should be skeptical of the AFS claims that the Electoral College is responsible for low voter turnout. This is empirically false as well, as Sky Gold of Business Insider finds nearly 139 million Americans voted this year according to the United States Elections Project. This sets a new overall record 
surpassing the all-time high of 132 million Americans in the 2008 contest, proving to you that voter turnout is actually on the rise, not the other way around. Third, Charlotte Alter of Time Magazine finds that voter turnout in presidential elections is historically much higher than in midterms, even though states don't have their own electoral colleges. This proves that there is a disconnect within the affirmative argument. And then let's move on to this argument they make about direct... Actually, let's go to how they talk about Electoral College having an unfair tiebreaker. First, the neg is going to outweigh on probability. This only happened one time in the 1824 election, which was a unique case because Henry Clay helped John Quincy Adams get elected. Av can't prove that A, this is a trend, and B, that this would happen again in the future or what the probability is of this happening. This election was expected to go to the House, but even it didn't. And then secondly, the Electoral College isn't unfair in regards to, to, to breaking ties. In fact, James Pipner of George Mason University explains that that the House of Representatives was chosen as a tiebreaker to prevent a powerful bureaucratic group from deciding the election. The goal of the framers was to create the most balanced system that they could. They wanted to make sure that in case of a tie, the too powerful Senate wouldn't be the tiebreaker. The framers made the safest decision possible because a tiebreaker can't be given to any other group without risk of trampling democracy. It's for these reasons I'm very proud to negate. Thank you. <coughs> Ready for cross? Yep. <clears throat> All right, so let's start with your uh, district. Uh, uh, counter proposal. Sure. Um, so, do you agree with us that the idea of you basically said that on the contingent election uh, question, it's so unlikely that we don't have to worry about it? Is that correct? Uh, what target are you referring to? That you said that the contingency election where we send it to the House is so unlikely that it's not worth considering. Right? I mean, it's just like the probability of that happening is so low that it shouldn't be an argument that's weighed very heavily in the rounds. Okay, well, what if we told you that under the congressional district plan, the 1976 election between Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter would have gone to the House? Is that a reason to reconsider doing the congressional district plan? No, because neither trend is established on either side, and we would argue that the system where it's more apportioned by district is going to be on that more beneficial to increasing voter turnout to solving a lot of the problems that you yourself point out in your case with the current electoral college system. What about if we said that uh, it would have given the 2012 election to Romney over Obama despite Obama winning the popular vote? Does that change your mind about the plan? So, like, this is cross so I can't ask you a question back, but I would argue that, like, there's literally no link between it being in districts. Like, what the, what, like, my question would be then, like, it what's is, the though, model? It is, though, because we calculate electoral votes differently if it's by district, and it would have given the election to Romney despite the fact that he lost the popular vote. Okay, then that is not considering the proposal that we provide, because our proposal is not just talking about apportioning electors to districts, but it's also talking about apportioning those electors proportionally to the amount of people that voted for them. So let's say 56% of the district votes red, then they'll get two, let's say, electors in the blue, like Democrats will get one elector, essentially. So it's proportional still. Okay, I think we're going to have to unpack that a little bit more, but let's move on to okay. your second argument. So you talk about how we should uh, implement compulsory voting and make uh, Election Day a national holiday. I guess my first question is, how is that competitive with a proposal to eliminate the Electoral College? Sure. So what that contention basically serves to do is to prove that the Electoral College is not the reason for low turnout, meaning that at the very end of the round, the judge can feel comfortable voting neg on presumption at the point where we're telling you that you don't give you don't you need a reason to as to why we uphold the resolution here, which is to abolish the Electoral College. If you can't prove a definitive causal link between the Electoral College and the harms that you talk about, then it's the judge should be very skeptical, skeptical voting for the affirmative. Sure, but in theory, there's no reason we can't abolish the Electoral College and make Election Day a national holiday, right? But that makes no sense, right? Because if Why? the Electoral College is not the cause of a decrease in voter turnout, then we could just implement things that actually help voter turnout, like abolishing voter ID laws, like implementing compulsory voting laws, like things like that. You don't need to abolish an entire system that actually has its benefits over direct national primary, which Riley will come up and explain more. Okay, but if we didn't do that, we would still be left with the problem that the system doesn't account for one person, one vote. But just quickly moving on. Okay. So compulsory voting, what's the penalty if uh, someone chooses not to vote? Uh, I'd probably be a fine. Probably be a fine? Yeah, that, I mean, that's what we defend. That's how it is in Australia, so. Right. Um, Fair enough. I think it's ultimate. Okay, countries. backlash. So you talk about how if we implement uh, public vote, uh, sorry, um, popular vote, uh, the public's going to just absolutely revolt. There's going to be a backlash against uh, popular vote. You think that might look something like the backlash against the Electoral College we saw after this most recent election? Probably not. It'll probably look much worse because, really? yeah, twofold. One, we don't have, like, the infrastructure set up to actually support a national popular vote system. We what, have the what, infrastructure what infrastructure would we need that we don't have? Because I'm pretty sure when I watched the election returns, uh, a couple months ago, they showed what the popular um, was. So Riley will get to this a little bit more in the next speech when he responds more directly to your case. But for example, one thing would be about the recount nightmare that would occur under a national popular vote. So for example, in the 2000 election where it was like 
coming down to a few votes in Florida. Instead, we would have to do a recount for the entire nation, yeah, which but, but that is only, problematic because counties have their own different ways they do recounts. Right, but that only There's mattered, no universal be, way that only mattered so. because we used the Electoral College. The actual popular vote between Gore and Bush you, you wouldn't have needed to have done. You wouldn't have needed to do a national recount. Right, that. but we would argue that when elections are really, really close under a national popular vote, it would more people would be wanting a recount. They would demand a recount, and that that recount would be more difficult. There's other harms though that Riley will bring up. Uh, before I begin, I'll go over our arguments, and then I will discuss um, uh, the arguments made on the negative side. The Electoral College is fundamentally a flawed system. It has been for years, and we advocate changing it. Our first argument was that it violates the one person, one vote principle. Equality is a fundamental part of democracy. As mentioned, on five occasions, the Electoral College has overwhelmed the public interest and popular vote. It violates political equity where small states have a disproportionate representation. My partner mentioned Wyoming, which has four times the amount of representation to the Electoral College than, country, than um, states like California. This leads to disenfranchisement of voters. In California, Texas, New York, Florida, Hispanics are 10% less represented, and Asians are seven less represented than white, uh, than white population. Further, the faithless electors goes against, uh, can go against uh, the pledged candidates. Seven of, the, seven of these happened in 2016, and in a number of other close elections, political scientists speculate that this could happen again. Our second argument is that it suppresses voting in the United States. Only battleground states become important. The focus on these 10 to 12 states ignores large swaths of the, pop, of the country which are solidly blue or red. A change to a direct popular vote would increase the amount of focus these uh, often ignored areas uh, will have. In 2016, Clinton and Trump spent only uh, spent 57 percent of their time in just four states. They spent less than five percent of their state uh, of their time in states that were solidly blue or red, and less than one percent of their funding. This is fundamentally going to change under a direct popular vote. Third, the possibility of contingent elections is perhaps one of the most undemocratic principles evidenced in the Electoral College. In the event of a tie or no one getting to 270 votes, it's simply up to the House of Representatives who becomes our president. They could vote anybody. It doesn't have to be either of the two candidates. Further, the Senate would have the ability to pick any vice president they see fit, which could lead to political infighting, corrupt bargains, as well as complete illegitimate presidents being placed into power. This is a terrible idea. and. Uh, if we move towards the uh, negatives counter proposal, we'd see more instances of this contingent election, which is the worst thing for um, democracy. They make a couple of points here on our on our um, um, advantages. On our second advantage, the voter suppression, they say that the counter plan is able to solve the counter plan. Uh, the counter advocacy, their direct um, uh, uh, the district allocation counter plan, doesn't do this effectively. In fact, it would create more voter suppression. Further, they say that alternatives uh, to voter, there are alternative causes to voter turnout. Um, the problem is that with the swing state focus, these 10 to 12 states are the only ones that are in play, usually less than that. In the most recent election, it was just four states, which means that under the continued plan, we're going to have an even more increased focus on specific districts, which further alienates the country and, and reduces focus. On the second advantage, they say that the uh, for the, or the sorry the third advantage for the contingent election, they say that the uh, the negative is going to outweigh. This is not uh, correct. It's this is the worst form of uh, the democratic system of the electoral college, as I mentioned above, and um, uh, only a direct popular election is going to be enough to solve that. On their uh, off on their first. Um, argument, the district allocation plan has many disadvantages. First, gerrymandering. Minority parties can win votes causing contingency elections. Nixon would have beaten JFK and the Carter-Ford race would have been a tie, suggests Judith Best, the political science uh, professor at SUNY New York. Further, district allocation would have elected Romney over Obama in 2012. And district allocation plans won't increase broader campaigning or increase voter turnout like they suggest, and it will exacerbate gerrymandering in many districts. 
This would be as a result of uh, even more competitive districts as opposed to larger state elections, which are important, which means that there'd be an even larger focus on smaller areas, which uh, reduces the um, amount of visibility these candidates get, and as well as the, the uh, issues that are in play. Finally, district plan will allow third party to win electoral votes and cause these contingency elections, which are the worst thing for democracy. Their plan doesn't fix this problem. It makes it worse and exacerbates it. On their second argument, which uh, they suggest is that we should make voting compulsory and have a national holiday, we agree. This isn't competitive with the stance of the affirmative position. They're going to get up here and say that we're not allowed to advocate this as well, which is not correct. This is something that is not related to the resolution whatsoever. It's a nice idea. Sure, we should have compulsory voting, and we should have national holidays to allow for more voter turnout. There, the counter-advocacy doesn't solve that. We agree, but this isn't a reason to vote for the negative side. If anything, it would, uh, you know, we should look at which system is better, the direct popular vote or their proposed counter-advocacy of the district allocation. That's what's the core of this. That is at the core of this debate, not whether we should have compulsory um, voting and holidays for voting, something with which we agree with. Their third argument is that there's going to be backlash against uh, candidate. Uh, there's backlash as a result of a uh, popular election, and this is untrue. I'd like to point to a recent Marist poll in 2016, which suggested that the majority of Americans support switching from the current system of an electoral college to a, di uh, a direct popular election. I can read some statistics for you. 52% of all Americans agree, 78% of African Americans, 63% of Latinos, and 56% of women think that we should switch. Further, we have a very clear plan as to how we would implement a direct election, which means there is no backlash. There is no reason why we, this would be perceived as illegitimate. If anything is perceived as illegitimate, it's the 2.8 million voters who voted for Hillary Clinton who were silenced in the last uh, election because of the Electoral College. That underline, undermines legitimacy far more than changing to a more democratic system. I'm ready for cross X. <laughs> Does gerrymandering happen in both the affirmative and negative world? Um, gerrymandering exists, yes. My contention is that it would be made worse under the district allocation plan. How? How? Sure. So state assemblies, uh, congressmen who decide where the, ger where the districts are would create specific districts that would be more play for these national elections where electoral candidates are up for grab, which would make uh, e the gerrymandering uh, uh, even worse. Where, where districts are already majority, like where districts are already decided, is it smart for a candidate in their campaign strategy to visit that district? Or does it make more sense for candidates to visit districts that are more split? The claim that I'm making is that the, pro the, the system of gerrymandering would be made net worse as a change of the electoral college okay, system. So I guess then how does our alternative make gerrymandering worse? I just answered that, but I can go through it again. So currently there's gerrymandering, which is how the different districts are set up. This happens <coughs> once every 10 years based on who's in power. If we change the electoral college process to a direct allocation plan, your advocacy, this would create more infighting and more narrow districts, sure. which would lead how, to more derision and more infighting among the uh, communities, as well as... How, do, how does allocating electors proportionately to like the, amount, like the amount of people that vote for them link into an exacerbation of... It has to... Well, yeah, that comes out of each district. The elector comes from a district that's selected by gerrymandering, Okay, so there'd be more fighting at the root the level, creating state. the districts. How's that different from the entire state voting, then? If a state's majority red or majority blue, and they get all of the elected this votes... This fundamentally upholds the principle of one person, better. one vote. It would be more democratic. It would allow people who uh, have the majority in that state to represent the consensus of that vote. It wouldn't base off some arcane mathematical formulas how we should apportion uh, electoral college votes um, through different districts. That's sure. even more convoluted than the current system. The American public doesn't support that. Okay. Like I cited in the last Marist, uh, the Marist poll suggests that actually individuals okay. are How against. Does alternative create more voter suppression? What's more voter war? suppression? It would increase the amount of fraud and it would likely create incentives. Why, Why would it create more fraud? Sure. Um, uh, for a number of reasons. People are more incentivized in smaller districts to 
uh, win those elector votes, which means there's probably an increase in fraud in smaller districts where it's difficult to okay. see at a uh, statewide uh, election based on national uh, based on uh, popular vote. However, that would be um, there would be no there would be less incentive for fraud because it's simply based on one person one uh, vote as opposed to the proportional so if, basis. if candidates had to appeal to the entire nation in order to win the electorate, then would that entail them creating a national media campaign? I'm not going to take a position on their national media campaigns. Okay. I am going to suggest that a direct, campaign. excuse me, a direct national, a direct popular vote would increase the amount of uh, uh, states that they had to visit, as well as cities, and would have a more disparate uh, amount of viewpoints incorporated into that position okay. of the candidate. Um, so they would have to go to more states, is what you're saying? They would, They would yeah. have to do a national Well, right now, we see that most candidates, they spent most of their time, Hillary Clinton and um, uh, Donald Trump spent most of their time in four question. states. So yes, definitionally, they would have to go to more states. Okay. Which is probably better. Okay. <clears throat> We'd like an informed electorate. We'd like to increase the amount of people who get access to the candidates to hear the issues to make an informed decision on who should be leading this right. country. Uh, you say that contingency elections are bad, but in the world of the aff or, yeah, in the world of the affirmative, what does it look like when there's a tie? There's, there's not no, going never, to be a tie. I mean, we're based on raw, I mean, it's a direct popular vote. There's well, what a winner. happens when the election results are so close that like, there's people a, demand a recount? What, what happens? We don't do recounts. So it's just the results are as it is, like, Yes. Yes. France, if France has had a <clears throat> France has had a popular vote for president, they've never had a situation where they've had to do a recount. Before I begin, <clears throat> it'll be the negative case, then the affirmative case. Is everyone ready? Their first response on the negative on the negative argument of a district electoral college counter proposal is that would lead to more gerrymandering. However, what Josh was getting to in cross examination is that first, because it's a congressional a congressional district, gerrymandering would happen in both world in both worlds, and it happens even more in the world of the affirmative. But second, districts are not winner take all by nature. The districts would be changed to where if there's 51% of the district is red and 49% of the district is blue, those votes would be apportioned to the uh, to uh, to the correct candidate through uh, through like through the elector system. This gets out of all of the gerrymandering offense that they have on this argument. But second, but their next argument, uh, but we would also argue that a district electoral uh, electoral system would increase uh, would increase overall voter turnout. This does not get responded to, as Chung from the Stanford Social Science Social Innovation Review argues that when you take that when you take away the winner take all system, you increase turnout by nine to twelve percent. This is important, as the Atlantic argues, when you increase voter turnout, you better increase representation among policies. We, if we prove that there is a larger increase in voter turnout in the negative world, you should be voting negative. With that, going on to our second argument, first. We would, uh, their response is that it's not competitive with the affirmative. First, we would argue that compulsory voting in national holiday for the election day would work better in an electoral college system. Second, we would argue that even if it isn't competitive with the affirmative, it still proves that there are alt causes for people not voting, which is a reason to not, uh, to not, add, to not listen to any of the affirmative arguments about the electoral college being the only reason for, for voter turnout being so low. Going on to our third argument, they fundamentally misunderstand what we're saying. We agree. We'll even advocate for a Gallup poll which shows 62% of Americans want a change to the Electoral College to be a popular vote. Our argument is that when you change the Electoral College to a popular vote, you are promising a solution which cannot be fulfilled. That's the Kimberling evidence, which argues that we don't currently have the infrastructure for the Electoral College. As Josh made it evidently clear, if we were to have a recount, it would only upset people even more so. But that's really important because Beckwich from, uh, from Time argues that it would lead to further frustration, which Politico argues would make people more underrepresented in the status quo, which, according to Satala from the University of Turku, means 15 percent uh, means that there will be a decrease in 15 percent of voter uh, voter turnout they tried to make an argument at the end of cross -ex that france has never had the problem france has a significantly lower population than people in the united states and the united states has historically had problems with counting votes such as palm beach therefore if there were to be a popular vote it would always result in the disadvantage of backlash with that go on to the affirmative case there are three responses to their first argument about violating the one person one vote 
first. We would argue that there is a difference between promoting state between promoting small state agendas and protecting small state agendas. The Electoral College is there to protect small states, not to promote them. And by giving the two extra electoral votes, it does that. Because if they didn't have those two electoral votes, states like California, Texas, New York, and Florida would dominate, which we would argue would even be worse under a popular system. But second, they're shifting the problem onto cities having more power. So instead of the 10 to 12 states being battlegrounds, it's 10 to 12 cities being battlegrounds because as they conceded in the first cross-examination, they would be, the politicians would be focusing on urban centers. But third, Gans of the New York Times argues that there are two problems with the popular vote. The first is that we currently don't have the infrastructure to recount and that it would be even worse if we had to recount. The second is that it would launch an increase in negative ad campaigns, which as the University of Michigan quantifies, negative ad campaigns decrease turnout by 14% because people don't want to vote for people who continuously talk bad about the other. That will also be important when looking at our Atlantic evidence, which argues that more turnout increases representation. If you're decreasing turnout, then you have less representation, only leading to more of the harms that they say currently happen by disenfranchising minorities. But going on to that argument specifically, first, it still happens in the affirmative world. Focusing on urban areas would still have the same effect of disenfranchising minorities. But second, it's even worse in the affirmative world because if 51% of the United States population is red and 49% of the population is blue, then it would still lead to the 100% chance that a red candidate be elected, silencing the 49% of the population which opposed, which would also serve as another link into the disadvantage of backlash. But the third argument, it comes from Cato Institute, which argues that the Electoral College is currently protecting minority rights by not allowing for, uh, for the second response to actually occur. But then going on to their second argument about suppressing voting. First, Josh argues that the District Electoral College would solve because it would not allow for battleground states to be formed. That's the Mueller evidence, which does not get responded to. But, but additionally, we also prove that there are different alternate alt causes to people not going out to vote. We would argue that if you look at a cost-benefit analysis, people, or that if people look at cost-benefit analyses and they say, hey, I would rather get an extra hour of sleep than go out and vote, we would argue that that's better than just assuming that the Electoral College is the reason people don't go out and vote. But third, political competitiveness is the determinant to, uh, to turn out not the Electoral College. If, a comp if, a, if, the, if, the, uh, if the election is deemed as close, then it would end up having more turnout not the Electoral College as being the cause. But next, the time evidence, which Josh reads, explains that voter turnout was higher, in, uh, that there was no correlation between the higher voter turnout and the, and the Electoral College specifically. But finally, the final response to this argument is that, when you in, that you're just shifting the problem from 10 to 12 battleground states to 10 to 12 battleground cities. On their final argument, remember, Josh argues that it's very unlikely for it to happen, therefore it should have a very low probability and a very low weight in the round. But additionally, on their popular vote solves, they are not actually solving for anything until they can prove an increase in turnout they cannot win the round okay are you ready yep you say that a uh, the counter proposal is better than the electoral college uh, in terms of compulsory yeah, in terms of compulsory voting as well as so uh, I yeah, think, wh why, what is the warrant for that claim? So I think that the compulsory, so we would argue that when you're looking, like if you were to have a direct popular vote, then saying, oh, hey, y'all should go out and vote, if it's just direct popular, would incentivize more partisan people to go out and vote rather but than actually educate says voters. that you have to. So exactly, let's so. say we have a direct popular vote. Everybody would still have to go out and vote. Right. Right. So, like, so how is how is your claim so that it would be comparatively even if that better claim, under like, the electoral college? Even how if that is claim that isn't true? true, like the argument still oh. stands that there are alternate causes to vote to decrease voter turnout that aren't the electoral college. Yeah, that's, that's sort of like a main reason, different issue. I'd like to focus on that's this. sort of the main reason we're reading the argument. We're not necessarily reading it as a solvency advocate. We're necessarily reading it as a solvency deficit to the affirmative. Um, okay. What infrastructure specifically is lacking to allow for a direct popular vote? Y'all have been unable to provide us what would happen if a recount would be necessary. So we would argue that the recount we measures would We suggest we don't need a, a recount. There would not be a recount. Right. And then it's that would be, on, right. And then that's another okay, link to the- What infrastructure specifically is I'm trying to answer your question. Okay. Can I answer your question now? Yeah, what, you could you name like a, what infrastructure? So I can talk now? Yeah, you're welcome to talk. Cool. So it's not specifically that there's a lack of infrastructure there. It's that one, if there is a recount, if there is a recount, then the infrastructure for the recount would not be there. So but second, I'm trying to answer. Well, no, I'm trying. So it's a twofold it's, answer. Yeah, like, you're, you're being misleading then. To our I'm not really being misleading. When you say that I'm trying to answer. Infrastructure fundamentally doesn't exist, and then you guys just say now. I'm just going to be quiet so you don't answer your question. 
You just did. You said that. No, that was one of. That's half the answer. Okay. Um, moving on. Um, Do I not get to answer your question? No. Okay. How does the electoral college prevent minority interests from being voiced? Uh, we said that the electoral college allows minority interests. Yeah. To How does it? So if we see, like, for example, in California, um, where ten percent less Asian American have ten ten percent less Hispanic representation and seven percent less Asian American representation. How is that helping minority? Yep, uh, it interests? would be worse than a popular vote system. So we'd argue that it's better than the popular vote, and we're arguing. How would it be better? Because so if, if it's we a could popular bring vote, that ten percent up in line with with um, because the demographics the popular of the vote state? system would focus on four to, or ten to twelve cities rather than ten to twelve states. Okay, that's a conflating of issues, right? So if, if currently the electoral college electors are the reason why people are underrepresented wouldn't maintaining that, that like, excuse me wouldn't maintaining that system still leave people underrepresented not really because we're changing it to a district system so it's and basically how, different how does that specifically solve for people who are underrepresented because it's no longer going to be on a state by state basis it's going to be on a district by district basis electoral college votes aren't done on a our alternative, our alternative is to make it on a district by district basis. Only two states in the status quo have it on district by district basis. That's Nebraska and Maine. That's why we're advocating for a change to do that. And so no, it's not on the it's not on the. But district it's district still not one person one vote. Then, if you live in a bigger district, we're arguing that the idea less. that you're trying to implement of a one person one vote one would never would be like it wouldn't be able to happen under a national popular vote because it would still give power to the people in the cities. But second, it would be more equalized under a world in which Josh and I offer. No, but their vote, your vote, if you live in New York or if you live in Nebraska, your vote counts the same. It counts as one vote. Right, and we're arguing that politicians would tend to go more towards like the like more would tend to go more towards the urban hubs, which you no, guys can. You, you, make it, you make it sound. You make it. You make it sound like right now they're out in like these rural towns with a hundred people in them. Most of Trump and Clinton's campaigning in Pennsylvania was done in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. In Michigan, it was done in Detroit. They're going to go to cities right, regardless. Right, but it would be more like that. It would be less like that in a district system and more like that in a direct popular vote system. Why? I mean, you all said the answer in first cross acts. You all said that it would lead to more people, or they would like they would want to go to urban hubs where more of a population is. So no, Houston, there's, there's. Look, you said it in they're, the gonna, first they're going to go to cities regardless. There's only a chance they go to more cities under a popular vote plan. Right, more cities is bad. Well, okay. we're going to take the uh, two minutes of prep time. So uh, before I begin, I'm going to start by talking about the affirmative case, and then I will move on to uh, discuss some of the arguments that uh, our negative opponents uh, brought up. Boston College wins this debate for three main reasons. We've articulated a plan to abolish the Electoral College that accomplishes, uh, we think, three main advantages that their counter-advocacy is not able to accomplish. First, it upholds the principle of one person, one vote. This is a core principle of our American democracy that says that an American citizen, regardless of where he or she lives, should have a vote that counts the same as every other citizen. Our plan upholds this. A national popular vote allows you to have a direct say in what goes on. Their counter plan, where they apportion electoral votes 
based on congressional districts still falls into the same trap that the original Electoral College does. It just makes it more arcane. Um, they've talked about some uh, complicated math that would happen with 51, 49 percent. Look, the end story on their plan is that if you live in a bigger district, uh, your vote counts for less. It's the same flaw that the Electoral College has. They do not solve for the uh, ignoring of the one person, one vote principle. On voter suppression, we've repeated this again and again. Hispanic voters are 10 percent less represented under an Electoral College system than uh, white voters are. This is a problem that is not solved uh, by the counter-advocacy. They, they keep the Electoral College in place and gerrymandering, uh, which is going to continue, especially now that congressional districts are going to become considerably more important in national elections, gerrymandering will continue to exist and local state houses are still going to draw districts that uh, systemically uh, disenfranchise uh, minority voters. We've also proved that there's lower voter turnout in non-competitive states. This is going to continue into non-competitive districts. As I'm sure everybody knows, most congressional districts are not competitive. Incumbents tend to be re-elected over 90 percent of the time. This means that uh, voter turnout is still going to be low in uncompetitive districts, which is most of them. I think something around 50 percent of congressional districts in the United States are actually competitive, which means that the swing state focus we argued was a negative thing will continue. It'll just be swing district focus. Finally, contingent elections. We continue to maintain that this is the least democratic uh, provision perhaps in our entire constitution. Allowing the House of Representatives to select a president, first of all, disenfranchises uh, voters in the District of Columbia. It also uh, leads to political inequality because California and North Dakota get the same vote in such a system, despite the fact that they have massively different sized House delegations. Now their counter advocacy doesn't deal with this, so we can only assume it leaves it in place. Uh, but actually worse than that, uh, it's going to cause more contingent elections. As we said before, uh, the congressional district plan uh, would have led to a contingent election in the 1976 uh, election between uh, Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter. So not only do they not solve uh, for contingent elections, they actually make them more likely to happen, which we feel is a significant reason uh, to reject the negative team and vote in favor of the affirmative. Now to move on to uh, explore some of the arguments uh, that they make. Uh, they said that turnout's going to increase. Again, no it won't. Most congressional districts aren't competitive. They have conceded uh, our evidence and our argumentation that says that people don't turn out in non-competitive states. They will not turn out in non-competitive uh, districts. They said that compulsory voting is somehow going to work better in the Electoral College than in a direct popular vote. This, again, does not make any sense. If they force you to vote, people are going to vote. It doesn't, it's not clear to me uh, what, how, how that makes sense, that it would somehow be different in an electoral college system. Uh, they said we can't follow through on the popular vote. Now this, I'm having a really hard time understanding it, uh, Judge. Maybe you're doing better than I am on this front. I don't understand what infrastructure we don't have. We have voting machines. Uh, presumably they you know, tally the total number of votes in each state, because when you watch the election returns, they tell you how many votes uh, come in. Uh, they can't really articulate a way uh, that we're not prepared to handle this. So I think uh, we've got all the infrastructure we need and you should have a pretty high threshold on uh, rejecting a common sense solution to end an archaic system of governance uh, because they say something about a problem uh, with infrastructure. They also make an argument that, well, you know, what would happen in the case of a recount? Well, we would do uh, a recount. I mean, we, we have provisions for that in the status quo. I might also add uh, France, uh, which does uh, do a popular vote for president, has never had to do a recount in its entire history. And it's true that they have a smaller population, but that's actually an argument in favor of the affirmative. As numbers get higher, as our population is several times larger than France's, it just makes it less and less likely that there are going to be an equal number of votes for two candidates. Uh, Moving on, uh, they said that uh, big states are going to dominate and that cities are going to become the battleground. Now, this is a common argument against abolishing the Electoral College. Here's why it doesn't make any sense. So there are swing states, and candidates focus on those. Let's take two of them, Pennsylvania and Michigan. In Pennsylvania, uh, Trump and Clinton focused on Pittsburgh and, Pencil uh, sorry, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. In Michigan, they focused on Detroit. Candidates are going to go to cities regardless, because you want to maximize the number of voters you talk to in any given campaign stop. This way, under our plan, there's actually going to be a benefit of going to a, state, uh, a city like Los Angeles or Boston uh, or Austin uh, in states that traditionally are red or blue, but now you can actually have a chance to talk to more voters. There's only a chance that by eliminating the Electoral College, candidates go to a more diverse geographic reasons. Because they're going to focus on cities regardless. Don't, uh, don't, be, don't be fooled under the Electoral College or under direct popular vote. There's only a chance that the direct popular vote leads them to more uh, diverse places. They also made an argument that there's somehow going to be more negative ad spending and that's going to reduce voter turnout. Uh, again, I, this makes, I, I don't understand what the connection is between the Electoral College and uh, negative uh, campaign ads. I would have a high threshold on evaluating this claim as well. 
I think uh, partisan rancor is going to be equally venomous, regardless of whether we have the Electoral College or a national popular vote. They said there are different alternative causes to not voting. I suppose that's probably true. Maybe if it's raining, people don't want to leave their house and go vote. But we've proven that the Electoral College uh, reduces voter turnout in non-competitive states. If the whole country is competitive, there are going to be more voters. Uh, overall, I would say abolishing the Electoral College is a clear, simple reform that will lead to a fairer and more equitable democracy. And I urge you to vote for the affirmative team, Boston College. Thank you. We're going to run our prep. Is everyone ready? All right. Starting on their case, let's look at a few reasons as why you can't feel comfortable voting for the affirmative. The first is going to be on this first argument of one person, one vote, and a few things key that they don't respond to. First of all, they completely drop the argument that our alternative just solves back for all of this because we proportion, we, we allocate electors proportionally to the people that vote for them. So if I, if you know, one district gets 60% Republican vote and gets 40% Democrat vote, it's not a winner take all system anymore. So people don't have that voter apathy that you do with the current system and our alternative solves back, meaning that the affirmative world is non-unique and it's not a reason to vote for them. But then second of all, remember we give you alternative causes to why voter apathy happens, voter ID laws, discriminatory practices, things like that decrease voter turnout. They have no causal link whatsoever throughout the entire round that the Electoral College is the one that is at fault for all of the reasons as to why voter turnout is low. And they also don't respond to the argument that people don't vote for logistical reasons, not just ideological reasons. People don't vote maybe because they're at work instead or because they are rather be sleeping instead of going to the polls. People vote, don't vote for different reasons, things that they don't solve back for, things that they don't attack, which means that we win on presumption at the very least at the end of the debate round, but there's a lot of offense that you can still feel comfortable voting on. But before we get to that, let's go on to their unfair tiebreaker argument. On this contingent election argument, they never respond to the fact that we are just going to be straight outweighing on probability the magnitude of our impacts of increasing voter turnout, in which we give you empirical, quantifiable evidence of how our systems and how the affirmative world decreases voter turnout and how we increase voter turnout is going to be a way more important impact than this arbitrary impact that they give you. But then also they don't respond to the GMU evidence, which tells you that the House is actually a good metric for breaking ties because this is the most representative and checks back on bureaucracy. Uh, then on to this popular vote argument. They ignore Gans from the Huffington Post. Uh, first, the recount nightmare. Remember, they tell you that if there was a recount, we would just do it. This isn't a Nike act, though. You can't just have a recount if the votes are really, really close. It's a lot more complicated than that because what the Huffington Post article explains is that 
not just states, but counties have different metrics and measures in which they actually conduct recounts, meaning that they don't have a universal way that they can actually have these recounts if it needs to be. And then they tell you that France actually proves that a recount won't ever happen, but the argument that we're making is that there are more voters in the United States probably that are going out to the polls than in France, and because of that, it makes the system a lot more complicated. It makes it a lot more likely that if an election is really, really close, people are going to have this backlash, have this resentment towards the national popular vote system and demand a recount, which just wouldn't be able to be fulfilled. But then on the suppression argument, um, they make this argument about white votes, but in their world, the majority of voters are probably going to be white because white people make up the majority of the electorate. That's really, really harmful to minority voices, and our electoral college system of a district system is better at protecting those interests. But then also, they don't respond to the Cato evidence, which tells you that the electoral co co college was made to protect minority votes, um, and that our district college solved that some Mueller evidence there will be no battleground states. But then also something really key is this negative ads argument, which is also under the Huffington Post argument against their national popular vote system. Their only response to this is, what does this mean? I would have a really high threshold when allocate like uh, analyzing this argument. However, like the argument is very, very clear, right? Like what happens under a one day national popular vote is that it will create more competition or not more competition, but it will make it so that negative ads increase because you have to appeal to a national campaign, meaning that you spread your resources thin. you have to increase the amount of money that you spend on a national campaign to appeal to the entire nation, which increases the amount of tactics, negative tactics that media campaigns use in order to prop themselves up and knock the, the uh, other candidates down. Down. That leads to a decrease in voter turnout by 14%. That's the University of Michigan evidence, which they don't respond to. That's a clean turn on the affirmative case and a reason why you can feel comfortable voting for the negative. But then, um, yeah, they uh, lastly, they say that the candidates go to uh, cities regardless in either system, but it happens more so in the affirmative world. The Electoral College, the system that we advocate for, incentivizes diverse geographic visits, especially from our alternative, because in the, like they say themselves, 50% of congressional districts are competitive across the entire nation. That's really, really key and use their evidence against them, because what that means is that these candidates will have to go to districts across the nation, competitive districts across the nation, to appeal to a moderate base, but it's better than what's in the status quo, because they have to go to different geographic areas with different interests based off of where they live. So it's not just going to be in these highly populated centers, but instead candidates will also have to visit rural areas, suburban areas, areas that have different interests than in urban areas, which allows for a more moderate base and a lot more representative politics. But let's go on to our case and a few reasons to vote. First, turnout is going to be the easiest way to vote for us. They don't give you any alternative as to how you're supposed to evaluate the round. And we tell you from the Atlantic, which they don't respond to, that voter turnout is so key because an increase in voter turnout leads to more and better representative politics, more representative policies being passed, which is going to be crucial because that leads to better governance. Under our district electoral college system, you actually will see an increase in voter turnout according to Stanford by 9 to 12 percent. That's going to be key because that's the only quantification in the round from, from either team that actually quantifies voter turnout besides negative ads. We are the only team that are giving you an actual quantification, empirical evidence of voter turnout increasing or decreasing. That's an easy way to vote for us. They tell you that gender, gerrymandering happens and all these things, but remember it happens in both worlds and that the winner take all is eliminated. So this gerrymandering issue is not a problem because these candidates will visit districts that are not so gerrymandered, that are not so decided. Like they tell you themselves, 50% of districts are competitive. Those are the districts that would make strategic sense for these candidates to campaign in. But then lastly, on this, uh, actually on the compulsory voting issue, this just means that it, it wasn't meant to be like a counter plan, right? It's just to prove that there's no reason to vote for the affirmative. They don't have to hold the resolution true because they can't tell you that the Electoral College is the reason for a decrease in turnout in the first place. You can just enact laws uh, or like strike down voter ID laws and you'd solve the problem while keeping the current system. And then lastly, on this backlash argument, which they completely misunderstand. Remember the time, which tells you that like we, like people want a, what their system that they're advocating for, but we don't have the infrastructure currently to actually have this system, and that people would be politically frustrated, which Satala tells you there would be a voter turnout decrease by 15%. Uh, for those reasons, negate. Good round. Good debate. Good debate. <laughs> wow, I did that on a live stream. Nice. <laughs> Hi, Mom.